Yeah, I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners and, um, and respect for elders past and present. Um, yeah, it's funny being the last person of the day, you're probably all bored as hell by now. But um, yeah, I guess I'm probably the smallest uh, representative here. Um, I don't, don't have a PowerPoint, so you'll just have to listen to my boring voice. Um, I wear many hats because we're a tiny organisation. We just have 10 houses. Um, and twofold started in 1979, but for the last 30 years have been essentially a housing provider and a provider of aged and disability care. Um, also had various employment things through CDEP, which and that of course stopped in the mid 2000s, um, and and that's when things really sort of started to turn downhill. There wasn't much employment opportunities, and um, yeah, the organisation really started to struggle. Um, when I came along four and a half years ago, there'd been a big change in the board and um, the board were under no illusion that they really had to change things or the organisation would just not continue, really. It would, it, you know, the age and disability care was moving to the Commonwealth, so there's a lot more compliance. We needed to go through PARS. And so we had a look at it and thought, well, look, what are the opportunities here? And, and really... The big thing was let's let's get our house in order. Let's you know let's actually have some policies and procedures and contracts for workers and job descriptions and all that sort of thing. And let's look at the opportunities for how we can diversify and find some new employment opportunities for people without something like CDP being there. Um, and so one one of the obvious ones for us was, so, so we went through all that process, went and got through PARS and we, we got our compliance up to scratch with the, all the care programs. Um, but right from the outset, I've, I come from a, a construction background myself. I was, um, in terms of housing, I was uh, working for Tangajira Council in Alice Springs for a while and, uh, really, and they look after all the town camps in Alice Springs. And I also worked for a, pl a place called Alperulam, which is a 400-person community about 700 kilometres from Alice Springs as a housing manager. Um, but yeah, so coming down to the south coast was very different in many ways, but it was also the, the sense of remoteness was actually quite similar. You know, it's quite interesting. You know, I, I just didn't expect that at all, I guess. Because for me, it felt like I'm moving closer to everything. But you know, you can sometimes in an outer regional place, you can you can feel you know like you're really far away from everything, especially being a tiny organisation. But so the first thing we said was, well, look, you know, we've got a real estate managing these ten houses. Um, why don't we take over the ma the maintenance of that? You know, it's costing us a lot of money. We haven't got any control over the quality. Um, so straight away, so we did that, and the outcome straight away was that our jobs are costing less. We had some employment outcomes out of it, and and the quality was a hell of a lot better. Um, so, but it was it was still just reactive maintenance. But once we got through PARS and uh, we developed the housing strategy thanks to AHO funding, and um, and then we start they gave us something to to drive us forward. Um, and, uh, and so our rent levels ended up going up um, and it was easier than we thought to implement that, but they're, they're at a cost rent model now and um, so we did actually have a planned maintenance budget. So we could actually start to consider that stuff, but uh, while this was all going on, we also, um, the, the construction crew were going really well and we ended up um, subcontracting to a Sydney company that had won a contract to do um, some upgrades to housing New South Wales houses in the Shire. And um, it was a bit of a pain in the ass at first that they, they were really quite incompetent but it, it worked out well for us because they ended up handing us their whole contract. So we did um, 13 full bathroom renovations and um, four renovations of, of uh, units. Um, and that all went really, really well. So at the same time, we'd been talking with the AHO about our backlog program, and they were quite... Uh, they, they just said, look, um, you know, we can't let a housing provider do the maintenance on their own houses. And we were saying... Our argument to the AHO was, well, we're maintaining them now. When you're, you're going to fly on contractors from elsewhere, 
who will probably, you know, we're, we're not going to have much control over the quality and then we'll have to take on the maintenance afterwards. So the board were really starting to wonder, well, if we're, if we're going to get this average work done, you know, is it, is it really worth it? You know, if we're going to have to go back in later anyway and fix it, you know, if, if somebody's done a bad paint job, for example, and you've got to go and repaint it, it's going to cost you more than not doing it at all. So, um, yeah, so that was the, the query we got to, but uh, I have to, have to say thank you to Simon because um, when, we, um, when we were going through these negotiations, he was the first person to really stand up and consider what we were saying and consider that the community really uh, wanted to create some employment opportunities and they didn't want to see, even if it was Aboriginal people, they, they felt this sort of envy and shame if, if um, Aboriginal people or anybody is coming from somewhere else when there's unemployed people sitting in those houses that would love to do the work. Anyway, um, we managed to successfully get it and so we ended up having a lot more control over the scoping of the work so we were much more interested in doing the major jobs. We didn't want to worry about all the small things because we've got a planned maintenance budget. So, um, and, and there was less costs associated with it in terms of, of managing it from the Land and Housing Corporation side as well, so we actually got more money to spend on each house. And, and our houses were also, our tenants really look after them, but they just hadn't had a lot of maintenance for many, many years. So um, it was great for us to be, to be doing this stuff in the housing, houses, and when we came across problems, we would use our responsive maintenance budget to fix them. And, you know, in particular, I don't know why, but plumbing was the worst thing out of every everything you know every wall we pulled out the plumbing was all wrong or you know stormwater pipes were just busted under a concrete slab under the house and things like that um, so we were able to to deal with all those problems and really pick our, our housing stock up dramatically and and the, the good thing was is also is um, we didn't have tenants calling me and then I call the AHO who call the Land and Housing Corporation who then call, you know, talk to the contractor about you know, works not being good or anything like that. We, we ended up in a really good partnership relationship with the AHO and we really just worked together. And, really, and it just went so smoothly, it was fantastic. So you know, I think as a model, you know, if, if a housing provider has the capacity and, and, and is, you know, has the building skills, I think it's a way to, to cut out a whole lot of government expense. I, I know, I mean, in our area, there's one contract in Nara that does the whole south coast. Now, they, you know, we've, we end up always with a lot of housing New South Wales stock sitting there vacant, even though we've got a huge homelessness problem. And it's all just because of maintenance. You know, somebody's got to come and just fix a, a lock on a door and a few other things. But they don't come because it's part of this big contract. And so we're currently sort of annoying the government now about, well, you know, this, OK, well, you, you think you're saving money having this one contract, but in reality, you've got all these people, you know, talking around in circles. And when you, when you could have a small contract with us and we'd, we'll look after all the maintenance in the Shire, the government assets, and you'll create, you'll, you'll meet your Aboriginal employment objectives and um, create employment in, the, in a really low socioeconomic area and give us pride in our, in our work. So that, that's sort of, I guess, I guess the future for us is, is we really want to try to lobby government and try to get some ongoing maintenance jobs. Um, but since we completed the um, AHO contract, um, we've gone on and, and uh, got ourselves a building licence, got ourselves on the Land and Housing Corporation panel. So we're hoping any work that, that they have coming up in the Shire will get a look into tender for. But we're also getting into other things. So we've done a bit of private work for people and we're now, currently I've got eight guys working on the Eden Wharf development, which is a, I don't know, it's a $46 million Commonwealth and state funded project. And it's, it's, it's not quite at IPP levels, but they agreed to do a 2% Indigenous involvement. The, the, the current state requirement is 1.5%. But we, we were able to negotiate with the government about what went in the tender. So 
we, we managed to squeeze them up to 2% and managed to, so it had to be local. So, and we're the only construction company in the area, so it was, it was, <laughs> it was great. So, so these projects are going to go on for the next year and a half. Um, there's, there's two separate contracts, so there's a bit of a break. But, um, yeah, we're, really what we want to do is try to get some bread and butter like maintenance work that keeps, means we can employ people ongoing rather than just having casuals that we've got to start and stop. Um, and, you know, these bigger jobs like the wharf or, you know, soon there's going to be a redevelopment of Marimbilla Airport Terminal. We'll definitely have a go for, go for that. Any, any um, refurbs or anything that come up, we'll definitely have a go for that too. Um, but th they're more of the cream on the top, which if we can make that business profitable, that then helps us prop up, prop up our less profitable things like housing and certainly our age and disability care programs that really are completely the opposite of profitable. But, you know, the board, the board realises that, you know, if we didn't do those programs, well, nobody would in a remote area. So, yeah, that's, that's essentially where we're at. Um, we're just, we're looking at a good future. We're, we're, We'd love to um, get a bit of support from government to build our capacity, but you know we're, we're still growing slowly without that. So anyway, that's it. Thank you.